250,000 subscribers. Let's get started. How's it going guys? Angus here from Makers Muse. I have actually been away for two weeks, so thank you for being patient and yeah, during that time we passed 250,000 subscribers on Makers Muse. So I've done subscriber milestone Q&As before and I'm actually going to put a link in the video description for previous ones because I've answered many questions before. But for this video I put out on the new community tab on YouTube uh, a request for any questions you might have to cover this very special milestone. And I say very special because 250 is an important number to me because 250k is a quarter of a million which is that golden number that, you know, as a YouTube channel you might one day reach. But it's also important because my first ever Q&A, I guess, or explanation and celebration of a milestone was for 25,000 subscribers I did back in 2016. And in that video, I went through my sort of origin story, if you like, of how I became a YouTuber and how I got into 3D printing. So again, that'll be in the description, you can go check that out. But uh, for this video, I'm gonna go through your questions and you uh, put a lot of questions forwards. <laughs> uh, so this might be a bit of a long video, I can't answer all of them, I do apologize, but I'll try to crack as many as I can in rapid fire succession, starting with this one. So Deltalus asks, do you have any particular methods for staying motivated? Mostly in general, but for more specifically when working on certain projects. So yeah, this is a bit of a tricky one. I definitely have had slumps where I've really struggled to stay motivated on certain things. And I am a bit of a tinkerer, well, a massive tinkerer. So often I'll be really focused on something for a while and then kind of lose interest and get distracted and drift into something else, which is actually, for me, arguably more of a problem than staying motivated. I need to, I struggle to stay motivated in one direction and see something through to completion. So a lot of creators will tell you, you can't force creativity. If you're just not in the right mindset, there's no point trying to force out a drawing or a 3D design or anything like that. It's just not gonna work. And even if you do, you'll look back on it when you're in a different mindset and just not be happy with your results. So. My advice would be, if you just can't get motivated for something, change your environment. Uh, I've done a video where I actually went to a dam in my local area, you know, it's a nice drive. It's a place where there's almost no one usually. It's a really lovely vista. For me personally, something I haven't done for a very long time is actually just take a proper holiday. A lot of my trips were business related for the last few years. So again, I've just gotten back from a, a holiday up in Queensland and it was really good to just shift my perspective and read books and just sort of chill, go for walks. And I'm getting back into it. This is the first day I've been back for two weeks, raring to go. So shift your perspective and then you'll start to find your motivation again if you're finding it trouble, if you're finding it difficult to stay motivated and on track. But yeah, try to finish things. That's one thing that I really struggle with still. David asks, are clearances different when you're designing a 3D printed part that interacts with an existing part versus when you're designing print in place parts that interact with each other. Uh, yes, kind of. Uh, if you're relating to a printed part that relates to another object like a, a, an actual physical product, not another 3D printed object, you can uh, use your pair of calipers to get dimensions off that. That's obviously not gonna change. So you only need to worry about the tolerances and clearances of your 3D printed part. But when you're printing uh, 3D printed parts that interact with each other, obviously both of those will have variable tolerances that you need to understand to make sure they can interact. So generally, if you're designing things for an existing object, you can have tighter tolerances, but if you're designing two 3D printed parts to interact with each other, you really want looser tolerances. Uh, I have my tolerance gauges, the version one and version two, to help you figure out what clearances work for your machine. Um, but generally, 0.3 millimeters is a good clearance for most 3D printers. That's what I usually go for. And if I want anything tighter, I'll usually you know, test test down to see if I can get a press fit or that sort of thing. CB Turtle, do you ever plan to building your own 3D printer? This comes up every time I do a Q&A. Yes, possibly, but it takes a lot of time and the world does not need another 3D printer, especially not another low cost 3D printer when you can buy one from China for $130 US that works great, the Tronx CX X1. Uh, so I might, but it would just be purely for the experience and not to sell or even release plans. It would just be for fun. At least for me, anyway. 
Gary Potter, congratulations, nearly there. <laughs> uh, just a quick thought, the purge block produced when using multiple filaments, does the block have enough structural integrity for machining? I think pen makers and such will get some interesting patterns through that upcycle. Yeah, that's a cool idea. Uh, so for those who don't know what Gary's talking about, when you have a single extruder, single, single nozzle extruder with multi-material input, like the Prusa multi-material upgrade, it needs to purge out the previous color and it needs to extrude that out. And that ends up with a purge block, which is occasionally solid plastic. And I say occasionally because it only purges when it needs to. So if you're doing a color change every layer, that purge block will be solid. And yes, you probably could do something with it. You probably could machine it. But if you're doing only purges, you know, every few layers, like there's a big gap where it's just red, for example, but there's black eyes at the top. It, uh, the, at least the uh, the slicer um, Prusa edition multi-material solution will actually not do a solid fill when it doesn't need to. It just does a, like a really light infill just to you know space that block up to when it will need to do a solid purge again. But I do really like the idea of upcycling the purge blocks. People are trying to come up with ideas for it all the time, and uh, it depends on the material properties. Obviously, PLA is quite low uh, temperature resistant. It's not very good for durability. But you could come up with some, some cool ideas. Uh, so yeah, if you print with a purge every layer, then you definitely could use that purge block for something else because it's basically solid plastic. TC Berry, congratulations, Epic Milestone. Thank you so much, man. Uh, who is your favorite maker YouTuber that inspires you? Mm, well, I don't really have a favorite. That would be unfair because everyone offers something different and valuable. I will probably say right now, the one channel that I really get huge inspiration from is Devon over at Make Anything. I, I feel that I'm very similar to Devon in terms of my upbringing and background in design. And uh, it's like we think kind of the same and it's a bit annoying. Like I've been working on this puzzle, this puzzle cube thing. And then Devon, while I was away, dropped a new, a new puzzle video showing that he'd been working on something similar like two years ago, which is awesome. And he's, he's a champion. So I love Devon's videos. And uh, I like to watch him because it's kind of like, for me, just a bit of a fun one-up, uh, one-upmanship. Like, I'm like, I see his awesome work and I'm like, what can I do to compete with Devon's work? So yeah, I, I love Make Anything right now. Uh, it's really good. Gregory Thompson, do you reckon Makers Moves will expand in future with maybe more makers, presenters making videos for the channel? Maybe. Uh, I will admit I am struggling to get past the... Uh, you know, it's almost like the entrepreneurial myth where I run a channel and now I do accounts. I liaise with his companies to organize sponsorships and uh, product reviews and this and that. So my time is full and I want to grow the idea of Maker's Muse to beyond 3D printing. And yeah, with other presenters is something that I've been thinking about for a long time. It's just getting that in place is very challenging and will take a bit of capital. So in future, it is my plan to expand, to have other people with amazing skills outside of 3D printing. It might be in cosplay, it might be in woodwork, metalwork. Uh, I'm not sure, but yes, watch this space. I am kind of wanting to do something like that in future. Simon Lambrick, I am a high school freshman with a passion for engineering and building, looking into the field of CAD and 3D printing, so I'd like to know how you first got into the hobby and what I and many others can do to follow in your footsteps. Thanks, Angus. Thanks, Simon. Uh, so personally for me, it was combat robots. So I was in high school and I saw Robot Wars on TV and I was like, holy bold, people make remote control machines to smash each other. That's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Does it exist in Australia? And it did. Uh, there was a few guys doing like, they converted a garage into an arena for featherweight robots, which are 30 pounds or 13.6 kilos or so or roughly. And they're doing it in, in Sydney. So I got involved and through their help and mentorship, I learned how to solder. I learned how to use power tools and basic hand tools. I learned how to use CAD. And um, a lot of my time towards the end of high school was just focusing on educating myself for the purpose of building better combat robots. Basically, I got an okay mark for the overall uh, high school thing, but I got into university because uh, I, I applied for industrial design and I took in one of my robot designs. And 
one of my favorite tutors there was asking me like, so what can you tell me about this? I'm like, well, I use this type of steel because it's wear resistant. They use it in mining. It won't shatter when it has impacts. And I use this CAD program to export a DXF of this format. And they're like, yeah, I think you'll fit into this degree. So <laughs> that's how I personally got into uh, design. And then industrial design just furthered my knowledge of the actual design principles. Uh, so I would find something that really interests you that can push your skills further and make it, make it, it's not like a, a, a chore to learn, it's just a pleasure. You know, it's passion to research these things and make awesome things. So for me, it was combat robots, but it might be something similar or completely different for you. That's just how I got into it. Tyler Lemaster, what do you believe would be a good printer to, as a, to get as a first buy and what software should I use that's easy to use and free? Uh, you must be new to Maker's Muse because that's pretty much all I talk about. Um, look, a good printer is completely subjective. I have my budget Makerspace series, which is designed for someone who is coming at a low budget to get up and running for free. So go watch that video. The link's here. It's a series. I go into everything, including like trying to get a computer for free. But uh, basically, my pick still for 2018, even though the price has increased, would be the Cetus for a good, reliable printer to get going if, you're not, if you just want a printer to print uh, PLA parts without any tinkering and free software, Tinkercad if you're new to 3D modeling, and Fusion 360 you can still get for free if you're in education or startup. Uh, Fusion 360, I've got my whole CAD for Newbie series, and it's powerful, it's hard to learn, but you can do some really cool stuff with it, and it is free, as I said, for education and startups. Don Archangel, have you considered moving to California? Wouldn't the collaborations with the numerous YouTubers in the area and the large maker community there help push your channel to the next level? Imagine doing collabs with fashionistas, scientists, gamers, yep, yeah, okay. Well, here's the thing. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, California is the hot spot for collabs. Um, and it, it's true, I might actually get, a, get further along if I was there. But for me, my uh, USP, my unique selling proposition is that I am in Australia and I am Australian. And it's, it's sort of what, what differentiates me from everyone else in this space. And it's something that I sort of really value. I love where I live. Um, I've actually moved so many times in the last few years trying to find somewhere that I'm comfortable with, that I can afford. And you know, we finally found a place that's a walking distance to the beach, there's rolling hills, it's safe. Um, it's, it's quiet, the fast internet's here. So yes, while I would probably get further ahead quicker if I was in California, I have no issue with building up to the point where I can just fly business class to another country to attend an event and then fly back. Um, there's, there's many YouTubers in different parts of the world that do that. And yeah, honestly, I don't see me ever moving out of Australia. I'm really quite happy with where I am now. Um, yeah but I'll be visiting California many times. That's for sure. Gradivus Ares, uh, can you come to Canada and help me set up my Mark III, please, lol? Yeah, absolutely, just on the back of that other comment. Um, if you book my return business flight tickets to Canada, I'm more than happy to set up your Mark III because I actually want to go to Canada to visit some other channels, some other YouTubers. <laughs> Luke Wyridges, where do you get all of your awesome Adventure Time shirts? Um, <laughs> My sister buys them. Uh, so every Christmas and birthday, because my birthday is like at the start of the year, really close to Christmas. Um, my parents and my family didn't know what to buy me because I was like building robots and, you know, 3D printing and this and that and tinkering with electronics. What do you buy a kid who does that? Books and t-shirts. So my sister discovered online sites for t-shirts where they do like, you know, independent illustrators doing mashups. And she just bought me loads of shirts over the years and I love them. Gerben, congratulations, thanks to you. I bought a 3D printer a year ago and it's been a very useful machine. Awesome to hear, that really makes me happy. Thanks for letting me know. Uh, question, I can see your time is very valuable. So you're gonna step at your game now, maybe employ someone so you can get more time to do big, bigger things, I assume. Yes, I really want to do something like that. It's just finding the logistics. I am registered as a sole trader in Australia, which is totally fine and it makes tax easy. But if I was going to bring someone on board, I would probably have to become a business, which makes things a bit more complicated. And it will probably happen in future, but probably not this year. Um, right now, I've had a lot of time away from the studio and I just want to get everything back up and running. Bart is asking, if you had the funds and time, how would you describe a 3D printer you would build? I get this one almost every Q&A. Basically, I would build a 3D printer that works every time without any issues with every file. Um, 
yeah, look, it still doesn't exist. Even in 2018, the best printers we have still struggle with some files. And I would just, I just want a machine that always works really perfectly. We're almost there, but we're not quite there yet. Filament Frenzy coming in with some rapid fire. What drives you every day? Uh, basically, what drives me every day is my passion to make and tinker with things and by finding this niche to share it with you guys. That's just so, so powerful. Um, that's what gets me up in the morning. Favorite printer to you ever? Uh, oh, I don't have a favorite printer. I, I really quite like my original art mini that got me through years and still works. Favorite item printed, again, to be really lame, it is the Red Bull can holder for my Echo, uh, which I still own and it's still got it. It's really filthy because it's covered in years of dust and spilt drinks and everything. I've had it since I lived in Perth. Um, but yeah, that's that's by far the most used object I've ever printed. It works really well. And uh, favorite design, my favorite design that isn't something I've designed, because that would be a lame answer, would probably be the uh, the Scan the World Initiative um, Triceratops skull. Yeah, um, that one, actually. Uh, yeah, I really like the, the Scan the World Initiative Triceratops skull. That's really cool print. Bravo Jewel, hi Angus, congrats for re reaching that audience. You've made some great torture tests, but what about an educational video about calibrating the printer to succeed in printing them? Kind regards from France. Uh, good point. I've been meaning to do a video like that for a very long time because you're absolutely right. Um, a torture test is great, but what happens if you want to improve your results? Well, you need some guidance. So yes, you're absolutely correct. I should do a video on how to calibrate your printer to get better results on those torture tests. Murex16, would you care to check out the Anet A8, a review or your opinion about it? Look guys, I've mentioned it many times, but I will not ever be reviewing the A8. It's just how it is. I know you can get great prints off it, but there has been some serious safety concerns outlined by the community and there's been some serious fire risks and possible fires caused by them. I know it's not just the A8, there's other cheap kits that are also risky, but I will never be reviewing it because my aim on Makers Muse is to empower your creativity and it doesn't fit into that. It's, it's a tinkerer's machine that you can get working well, but it's like empowering your tinkering, not empowering your creativity, which a 3D printer should be a tool, not a hobby for what my overarching message is. Rain and Bone Gale, Bone Gale, sorry. The 3D printer YouTube space seems to be too small of a space to have many broad topic channels. What do you think are the niches of 3D printing one can explore and build upon? You're absolutely right. You need to find a niche that you're passionate about and go for it. Unfortunately, I can't tell you what that is because there's an infinite number of them. Uh, again, just find what you're interested and passionate about and share it. Uh, one of my favorite up and coming channels is Gear Down For What and he's passionate about gear trains and crazy reductions and really cool stuff in terms of using 3D printers to make those projects. And that's a really unique, unique way of using 3D printing that no one had really done before. So he's finding success in that area. And again, for me, you know, empowering creativity through 3D printing and technology. It's not just about 3D printing for me. They're always just a tool. A lot of other channels are, you know, more hardcore about the actual uh, technical side of things. So find what you're interested in and just go for it. But I can't tell you what that niche would be. Simon T, when are you going to be doing more live streams? Um, now I'm back quite soon, hopefully. Sorry about the delay. If you guys don't know, I do all my live streams now on a secondary channel called Make His Muse Live because I found there's a big sort of uh, split between people who wanted to watch them and people who just wanted to watch more concise content on the channel. Um, and uh, yeah, I do really feel for all those new up and coming channels because that one was started at the start of this year and um, it's still not even eligible to be monetized despite hitting the goals like a week in. So yeah, YouTube is really dropping the ball with that. So again, don't rely on AdSense guys. Mr. Dim, why do you exist? That's a really good question. Um, why do any of us exist? Uh, I assume you want a realistic answer. I exist because I like to share my passion with people. And it just so happened that people like to watch the, the videos I made sharing my passion and it became a job. That's why I exist. Nami's asking, do you think your channel could have become this popular if you hadn't changed as a person since starting YouTube? Could it still have taken off if you'd been your present day self back then? So look, I don't think so. What the channel is now and who I am now is very different to when I started, but my message has always been the same. The passion has always been the same. If you go back to my first videos on this channel, 
Um, I was clearly uncomfortable in the camera and I, I've gotten better, but I still am a very shy person. Uh, I've always struggled with, with public speaking and that sort of thing. And yeah, like I used the YouTube platform to share my passion without actually being in front of people. So it actually helped me overcome a lot of that, a lot of that awkward social shyness. And I wanted to share that and I've become, I guess, more confident in public because of this and because of what I, you know, this is, this is me right now practicing public speaking. Sometimes I stuff up my words, it doesn't matter. I've had to overcome the, the fear of making mistakes because it doesn't matter. No one really cares. But I've had to learn so many other things along the way, like video editing and lighting and audio and, and thumbnails and algorithms. So it's not just about me growing as a person, it's also about me learning skills to improve the quality of my videos and hopefully my offering on the channel, which hopefully grows my following. XC31, congrats, what's the name of the song you use in your intro outro for your videos? So again, I make all of my own music for the channel. I do electronic music as a hobby and by doing that, it keeps me unique and also make sure I don't run into any copyright issues. Um, so I just use um, the, the, this thing doop, 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 to make, um, make my music and that's what you hear on the channel. And if you want to hear more music, you can go to the SoundCloud link in, down below. I don't put everything up there. Obviously, like my, my backing tracks and stuff are not public because I want to make sure they're only mine. But some scratch tracks and stuff are there if you want to see what else I make. Amit's asking, besides your content, I've always liked your great graphics. Can you speak of how you came up with your logo and animations? Thanks, Angus. Thanks, man. Uh, so, yeah, again, um, being having studied industrial design, we did do a bit of graphic design. And it took me a long time to come up with a logo, which has evolved over the years. But essentially, it all culminated to a, uh, a fairly uh, drunken evening where I just sort of fired up Illustrator and traced out an M and a U. And because of the fills, it looked really good. And I tweaked it. And that's what I got ended, I ended up with. So it looks like Australia. It kind of looks like an M. Um, it's, it's up for interpretation. It, I tried to make something quite unique. And it turns out that it's quite recognizable as well, which is which is good. So, um, yeah, it took a lot of lot of tweaking and, and ideas, but the final design was actually quite quick to come up with. And yeah, I just just messed around till I came up with something I liked. Nathan Wilson, do you plan on exploring complex puzzle prints in future, like the Rubik's cube, etc.? So, yes, absolutely. Um. So, if you guys don't know Nathan's channel, shout out to him. He's another fellow Australian who I've just just been starting to talk to who does Rubik's cubes and puzzle cube modifications. It's a whole world I didn't even know existed. It's crazy. Um, and yeah, I've been doing more puzzles recently, which I really find enjoyable as a way to push my skills in terms of mechanisms in a useful and enjoyable object. And I am definitely going to be doing more puzzle prints and more mechanisms in future because that's really what I'm passionate about. And I find people seem to quite like seeing them as well. So definitely more of those coming. Technical flow, what do you think 3D printing will look like in five years? What technologies will be still present and what quality will we get on a home budget printer? Uh, yeah, really good question. I personally think, looking forward to five years time, we're not going to see FDM anymore. I think that's going to die out. It's a bit like the dot matrix of 3D printing technologies. It's early, it's easy to do, but it's not very precise. The technology I think that's going to take over is it's called resin jetting. So there's machines like the, the objects where they have a basically an inkjet head sort of thing with nozzles like in a row and it jets UV cured resin into a layer. And then a UV curing light comes over and cures that layer. And because it's got the different jets, you can have different resins. So the really sophisticated ones can do different colors, different shore hardnesses. So you can have parts that are rigid, parts that are flexible. What I think we're gonna see for the basic level in home use will be a like a jelly-like support and a more solid, probably gray, knowing how these sort of things go, rigid build material. And it will jet out um, and then produce your part that you then, I think we'll get to the point where you just rinse it underwater, honestly. I think we'll get to resin technology where that's safe and you'll end up with a part that will be a UV cured resin. Uh, in terms of environmental friendliness, probably not the best, but in terms of ease of use and quality and reliability, I can see that being really, really, really quite reliable. The, te the patents for that technology are still very strong and protected, so it'll be a while away. 
it might be the company, the original company that does it, or it might be patents expiring that spur us another company to make it cheaper, like FDM became cheaper for that reason. Um, and also it's gonna make consumables very easy because it's, it's just a liquid resin. You're just gonna plug it in and then print with no interaction. It's very simple. I think that's what we're gonna see in future. And that's gonna do it guys for this 250,000 subscriber special here on Makers Muse. Thank you so much for your support. I am blown away by the community in 2018, how 3D printing has really found its niche and it's found its use. It's not this, this hype anymore. The, the, the news doesn't give a crap about it anymore, which is exactly what we want. We want to be using 3D printing and, and other advanced manufacturing technologies to make cool things. And that's what we're starting to see now in 2018. You know, really well-established communities use 3D printing to make cosplay and to make products and to make tabletop figurines and just all these cool, cool things. That is just amazing to see. So thank you for coming along with me on this journey, guys. I really, really appreciate it. As I said, I've spent a lot of this year being away and uh, I do appreciate your patience. I'm so happy to be back. There is nothing in the future that will be pulling me away from this channel for at least a few months. So you can look forward to heaps of new content coming out. I've got some really cool machines coming up to review. I've got some really cool projects to do and I really hope to see you there. So thanks for watching guys and look forward to seeing you again very shortly here on Makers Muse. Catch you later guys. Bye.